Hi guys. So now we're going to begin a complicated process of going through Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. In the folder for Monday, Wednesday, Monday through Wednesday, um, I do have the abridged version, a textbook version, um, a breakdown of this week, plus seven stanzas that are not included in the abridged version. So I did ask you to read this portion, but um, on further reflection, this background details of one through seven really needs to be explained to you as efficient as I can. Um, so what is gonna end up happening, I have created a cheat sheet of the whole list of stanzas one by one and these just condense down the most important facts you need from each of the stanzas um, i'm going to walk through the first seven and then talk about the ones that are in the first few pages of the textbook the abridged version <clears throat> now the first thing i need to point out the writer of this poem, it's an epic poem. Um, his name is referred to as the Gaiwan poet. We don't have his real name. <clears throat> it's just attributed to him because of a collection of works that have a common dialect of Middle English and all the publications and they all have a running theme within them. Um, so the, the guy when poet wrote a handful of works that can easily be connected together by the structure and the language that he uses. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, little is known about him. All we have is this one document. This book in itself, the Sir Gawain and Green Knight, stands as something unique in literature because it is not extensively connected to a previous story. It does incorporate some themes and um, tropes which have existed in medieval times, but for the most part, this is very unique. It's original. He's taken a whole new stance and he's reinventing a whole new <clears throat> world to explain medieval culture. The culture of his times. Okay. Um, okay. Now, the stories here are all based on King Arthur traditions. King Arthur is the young king who establishes Camelot and he unifies all of Britain and Camelot exists as a utopian environment for a number of years and sadly it falls apart and it's corrupted and it disappears from history. Um, it is a mythical version of early Britain. It is not, it's probably loosely based on fact, but we don't have an exact location of a gravesite for King Arthur. Um, we only have these stories that have been collected over time. The main character of this text is appropriately enough, Sir Gawain himself. He'll be introduced in the text. Uh, so I'm going to start with stands, the first stanza. This is the same translation that is composed of the abridged version I showed you a second ago. Okay, um, I will need to make this larger. Make it a few sizes. There. Okay. So now it should be legible. 
uh, they are numbered. Okay, John Gardner, the translator, did number them as he was going through the material. So this stands as one stanza, the first stanza. In the abridged version I provided you, they do not number the stanzas, which can be a headache. Okay, so um, the version I gave you is the same John Gardner version. It's just the editors chose not to provide you with the numbers of the stanzas. The fact that they are numbered is one of the main reasons I like to use this text. Uh, it's it's modernized English. Um, it's very well translated. It, it proves a point and it uh, opens up discussions that are important for this uh, medieval time period. Uh, the other thing I'd like to address, the stanza, this full stanza, is called a bob and wheel stanza. It's called a bob and wheel mainly because of these bottom lines here. Okay. Um, you'll notice when you read the whole work, it doesn't rhyme. It has a, a slight structure of, an, uh, of a, um, a meter count. Uh, but I won't get too involved with that, okay? Just remember, it does not have a rhyme scheme in the upper chunk of the stanza. In the bottom stanza, however, in the bob and wheel proper, it does have a rhyme scheme, okay? So this line here that says, with joy, that is the bob. These last four lines are called the wheel. Between the bob and the wheel, it does have a rhyme scheme. In this example, it's slightly um, obscure because the word joy and the word sway are not a perfect rhyme. However, wonder and blunder do rhyme. Sway and day do rhyme. So, uh, in theory, the way the bob and wheel will work in this work um, it rhymes A, B, A, B, A. Okay. The other thing, I am not going to read each stanza in full. I'll only pick out strategic lines. Uh, it is important that you go back and review the material and read the, over what I'm discussing so that you have a clear view for the resulting paper, okay? And that will be a part of the next unit for you guys. Again, stanzas one through eight, count including eight, uh, they consist of the backstory explaining the function of Camelot, and the hist uh, a brief history of Arthur, and it will introduce Sir Gawain to you. Okay, so as far as number one is concerned, notice the first line says, after the siege and assault was ended at Troy. Troy, you may know, is the city in the Iliad, Homer's Iliad. What the Gaiwan poet is doing, and this is really important, he is establishing the use of an allusion to the ancient world. By doing so, he's showing his background history. He's well taught, he's well read, and he obviously had um, the knowledge of Latin and maybe Greek writing. Uh, so, Troy, in the story of the Iliad, Troy is under attack by Greece. You've heard of the story, or you heard mention of the Trojan horse. 
that's where Troy was defeated by the Greeks. The Greeks built the horse, hid the soldiers inside, and it eventually ended up inside the city, and they were able to uh, take over and decimate the, the whole city. Um, as a result, the people scattered. Okay, so the Gaiwan poet is giving you this background information of Troy, and there's a reason here. There is a logic to this going way back in history as far as Britain is concerned. Um, okay, so after the siege and assault was ended at Troy, the battlements breached and burnt to brands and ashes, Antenor, he who trammels the, of treason their rot was well known for his wrongs, the worst yet on earth. Now, the Gaiwan poet is bringing up a notion of a character who will not play any part in Sir Gaiwan the Green Knight. This is just showing you he understands the full story. Antenor is a character who brought about the uh, fall of Troy, okay? So you can disregard his mention here, okay? Uh, the Gaiman poet's going to bring up Aeneas, who was a hero of the time period. Aeneas has his own adventure. He leaves Troy um, after it's fallen, and he struggles to survive, and he has his whole series of adventures. Other Trojans who left the region, uh, you've got Romulus. Romulus eventually goes to Rome. I'm, I'm sorry, R Romulus eventually goes to Italy, um, an open territory at this point, and he establishes the city of Rome. Romulus founds Rome. Um, other people who fled Troy from up here, other nobles, other men who love Troy, like Romulus, like Aeneas, they'll have their adventures and they will found major um, Western civilizations, as it's mentioned right here. Okay, so you've got Tineas who produced Tuscan, and then you have Langaberde who um, founded Lombardy, and then you have in France. Um, I'm sorry, uh, over the France flood, the French flood. So that territory of water between France and England. Felix Brutus, on the slopes of many broad hills, established Britain with joy. So you have the founding nature of a colonization civilization that's coming into a wilderness of Britain and establishing the first known cities. Don't confuse Felix Brutus with the same Brutus who ended up um, in the assassination of Julius Caesar. Totally different Brutus. But this Brutus is an important figure for England. It's from Felix Brutus you get the establishment of a civilization and uh, a sense of identity. The Gaiwan poet is starting way back at the very beginning of the whole background story. Okay. In stanza two, it opens up with, and after Britain was built by that brave baron, referring back to Felix, bold lords were bred there, men who loved battle, what the guy with poet is doing, he's establishing the genealogy of how Felix Brutus, from the ancient story of Troy, is basically a forefather of Arthur, the king of England, of, of Britain. Okay, so Arthur has in his bloodline a connection back to ancient history. That's why the guy with poet started there. He wants to show the importance of all of British kings, particularly Arthur, are honorable men and they come from classic identity. 
In the st second stanza, likewise, the poet mentions himself with the pronoun I. I will tell it all. He's going to provide everything to you. Um, and at once, as I've heard it told in town. So, using tongue-in-cheek, he's establishing this story. He's heard it before, and now he's putting it down in print. He's elaborating on it, and he's going to provide it to you, the reader. In the last line, he does bring up the Nordic tradition of the Scops. This text, this um, transcription, is honoring the Anglo-Saxon notions prior to the Middle Ages. So this is picking up from a history in the late Anglo-Saxon period, even though it's written during the Norman period. Okay. So what I want you to get out of this, every so often you'll see a, um, a reference or an allusion to the time when Beowulf was being written. Okay. You'll always have this connection of a present moment being connected to a previous era of greatness. And this is just another example. The same way Beowulf is honoring earlier traditions of the Anglo-Saxons and the Viking era. Okay. So that's two, establishes the poet himself, bringing himself into the text, and establishing the connection of author to the past. Camelot is being presented to you in the remainder of the stanzas, is being presented to you as a paradise. It is a utopia on earth. Um, when you read through number three, they'll mention how happy these people are, how noble these people are. Okay. Um, so, King Arthur is at Camelot during the Christmas season. This is considered a Christmas poem. For whatever reason the English came up with this concept, uh, Britain loves to have ghost stories told over Christmas season. If you think of the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, that's just another example. It's a ghost story. It has a strong moral at the closure of it, a, a major message. However, it's still a ghost story, and that's what England likes to read during this season. The other thing of importance, uh, it's Christmas season runs for many weeks. You've heard the 12 days of Christmas. They range from the middle of December all the way up into um, early January. Uh, this season, these, num these three or four weeks, Arthur is having a feast. So every day he's having a major celebration because he has the money, because he has the means, he's upper class, he's celebrating Christmas almost every day. He is a gentle lord. He's established the round table and the knights of the round table are important valiant people, valiant men, and they follow the knightly code. They're following the chivalry concept that's established of this time period. It is a code of honor. Okay. Um, you'll notice down here, right here, joyful din all day long and dancing all night. You'll, throughout this text, it's all about drinking, it's all about eating, it's all about having a good time. That's how you celebrate when you're noble. When you're not having an adventure, you're back in the castle and you're, you're having a well, a, a strong meal and a good drink. Happiness reigned on high there in halls and in chambers where lords and ladies delighted themselves as they liked. With all the goodwill in the world, they dwelled there together. 
the most renowned of knights next to Christ himself and the most loveliest ladies that ever li yet lived in the land and their king, the comeliest king that ever held court. So again, this is uh, establishing that paradise, that strong sense of happiness that's everywhere in the land because Arthur is a good king and Camelot is a major moral upstanding city of example. Okay, that's stanza three. Stanza four, like I said, the Christmas season goes on for many weeks. And because Arthur likes a good feast, we've moved forward for the new year has been established. So while the new year was still young, they're still celebrating Christmas. While the new year was still young, it was newly fallen. It just happened. The nobles sat to, to a serving on the dais, and that's the platform. Like in graduation, that's the platform with all the important people um, on a raised platform. And below are the other knights in their benches. Everybody celebrating. For the king and all his knights had come down to the hall when the chanting of mass in the chapel had come to an end. Notice the reference to the uh, Catholic faith. It'll be mentioned off and on throughout this piece. It's an important part of the tradition, uh, more so than just the Christmas celebration. It is part of the chivalry tradition. A good knight will follow a Catholic agenda and that his, his morals are embedded from his Catholic faith. Uh, noted here, praising Noel anew. So all the knights are praising Noel anew and calling it out often. Uh, the, the lords rushed about giving out hansels, and that's gifts. So the lords will give out the gifts to the ladies. The ladies give out a kiss in return. The religious aspects in this case, are a little less emphasized. So it's moving from this Christian concept to this more pagan-like atmosphere of celebration. Okay. They keep the two categories. It's a duality that functions within the society. Queen Guinevere is mentioned here. She is the wife of King Arthur. Uh, so everyone in the dais are sit seated by rank, and Queen Guinevere is in the center of the dais, that raised platform. Arthur will be to one side. Placed on the blazing dais, adorned all about with the finest of silks on all sides and streaming above her a tapestry tent out of world famous Tars and Toulouse embroidered and splendid spangled with sparkling gems that might well prove priceless if anyone wanted to buy them someday. This is just establishing, uh, stanza four, is establishing now the importance of Queen Guinevere. She is being objectified, yes, but she is the most beautiful woman in Camelot. And she's a major figure. She's the perfect hostess. So just like Queen Wealthio way back when we read Beowulf, Rothgar's wife, Guinevere is functioning as the perfect hostess. She's seated on the dais and she is having a good time and making sure everyone else is enjoying the meal. Notice what these stanzas are doing. We're moving through a hierarchy of people. You've got one, stanza one, establishing the background importance of the heroes of the ancient world, which on a chain move to King Arthur in stanza two, then it moves to stand, by the time you get to stanza four, you get Queen Guinevere. These are the important players.
Okay, that's stanza four. Stanza five, what's going to be established here on this time period when King Arthur has his feast on the Christmas season, he will not eat until everyone else has been served, okay, and after he's had a, 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 a nice or a, um, not a nice, that's not the word I'm looking for, a, a, a strong Christmas story. He wants a tale, a strange tale about some most mysterious thing, some monstrous marvel that merited belief of the old ones or of arms or of other adventures or until some stout lancer had sought of him some sure knight to join with him in the joust and in jeopardy lay mortal life against life. So Arthur wants uh, an excitement before he can settle down and eat. He wants the entertainment and then he'll eat. He doesn't mind if everyone else is eating, but for him personally, as a New Year's tradition, he says he has to have that entertainment and then he'll eat. This is the king's custom notice. Okay. It's the king's custom when the court came together and each of the fine feasts he held with his freemen, the other knights, in the hall. Therefore, bold in his manner, he stands at his place tall, waiting, young on the new year, laughing and talking with them all. So, this is a foreshadow of the events that are going to unfold. That stands a five. So by stanza five, you've got that inciting moment that's telling you the conflict's going to start rising and you're going to start getting suspenseful stages of events. In stanza six, you get the first reference to Sir Gawain, and there he is in blue. This is the first time he gets introduced. And again, this is one of the moments that I dislike the version, the abridged version that I had given you to read. Um, they skip Sir Gawain until later. It's so he's mentioned in stanza six. Um, okay, Sir Gawain's an important player. What you learn from this section are names of other knights, but he's seated right by Queen Guinevere. And the reason for that is because his sister, I'm sorry, King Arthur's sister gave birth to Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain is a nephew of King Arthur. So technically he's of royal blood. He could, if you follow the hierarchy, he could become king. Knowing the full story, however, he doesn't become king, but he's an important player. He's got the right blood to be up on that dais next to Queen Guinevere. Okay, so down below you notice everyone's still having a good time. There's 12 dishes, cold beer, and brilliant wine. And uh, stanza six does elaborate more on the, elaborate on the food and drink. Okay, stanza seven is, has a transition, but now I will speak no more of their sumptuous banquet, for as every man must know, there was nothing missing. Another strand of music now sang through the hall, encouraging each of the nobles to eat all he might. <clears throat> What's going to happen in Santa 7 is the entrance of the actual Green Knight. So keep in mind, Stanza 6 introduced Sir Gawain. Stanza 7 introduces the antagonist, the Green Knight. Um, and right here, it begins. And strangely, almost as soon as that, the music, 
As that sound died out and the first course had been courteously served to the court, there hailed through the door of that hall an ungodly creature, a man as enormous as any known on earth, from his wide neck to his rib cage, so square and so thick, his loins and his legs so long and so loaded with power, I must hold that man half giant under heaven. And yet for all that, a man he must still have been and the handsomest creature that ever yet rode horseback. Notice the contradictions that are being woven into this stanza. <clears throat> He's first introduced as being ungodly. He's enormous. He could be considered a giant, but, and yet, He's a man, and he's very handsome. This duality is going to play into his construction throughout the whole piece. The narrator will say one thing about how almost demonic he appears, and he'll do something very mystical and magical or unchristian. And then on the other hand, you'll have this flip side where he's doing something um, sacrificing of himself in order to better someone else. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little more description given here of how he looks and his physical build. Um, it mentions how his waist and his belly are worthily small. So despite his enormous stature, he's not stout in the gut. He's, he's uh, like a football player a quarterback football player. Um, all his features are princely and perfectly formed and clean. So from this standpoint, from this description, he's being described to you as a typical protagonist. But there's a twist. And here's the twist. But astounded, every man there stared at the stranger's skin, for though he seemed fine and fair, his whole great body was green. So you got this really giant of a figure who has green skin, green hair, green beard, green clothing. Everything's green. And there you get his title, the Green Knight. Sansa 8 is going to take this a step further. He came there all in green to Camelot, both the clothes and the man, a coat tight-fitting and long fastened to his sides. And here you're getting more detail about his actual clothing, uh, the tights he's wearing, the jacket he's wearing, um, the gold that's interlaced with the green fabrics. Okay. There's a lot of detail here to show you how rich the clothing looks, how um, important the man himself is. He's not like a typical monster or ogre. This is a noble knight who just happens to have this intimidating, um, impressive personality. Um, even his horse is green. So the horse is even described here, a great horse, huge and heavy and hard to keep in hand, who bridled and bristled roughly, but knew the knight's command. And that's stanza eight. As you read from the abridged version, it starts out with stanza nine. Sorry, that opened up an area I didn't need to go to. Uh, so the abridged version that you were reading the last three days, right here, it opens up with stanza nine and how the knight appears in front of the dais. Okay. So I'm going to make a quick point and close out this video for now. After it opens. Uh, 
Everything's being slow today. Let me reduce this in size a little. It's being stubborn. The material I want, I believe, will be on the third page to, yeah, the poem proper starts on the third page. I just wanted to point out One quick thing. While well, we're still waiting. So on page nine, it'll give you a brief synopsis of what we've gone through. Stanzas one through eight. Okay. Um, if it makes it uh, more comprehensible for you, uh, do look over this intro commentary from the editors. But I will point this out. This portion here where it talks about the ideal night, that is one of the major themes in this work. The ideal night will follow the chivalrous code. Remember that. And that's one of the things that Sir Guywin is wrestling with, how to be the perfect knight. He's obsessed with this idea. Um, here we go. Um, the other reason I hesitate to use this edition, this abridged edition, you'll notice the bob is here, but the wheel got cut off onto the next page. So that's why I like that other version I provided to you. So this is stanza nine. Ignore uh, These line counts are going to be established by the editors, so ignore these line counts. If you reference stanza nine in an essay, you would count, I mean, you would follow this count for this stanza, but then right here for stanza, I believe that's stanza 10. Yeah, that's stanza 10. Um, the count starts over again. Basically, what I'm going to end up doing to make this easier and for it to function in a stronger academic fashion, I will choose specific passages for you to cr create a long response essay. And I'll have them numbered. Uh, they will be of this same translation and from this edition. It'll just look different um, with a different format, okay, to make it easier on you. But we'll talk more about this as we go along. Um, okay, so that's where I'm going to stop for now. Tomorrow I hope to create a, another video. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned this, so um, it's, but it's important to repeat it, if so. The Sir Guy and the Green Knight is considered an epic poem. It is composed of four parts. Um, I like to say they're four books. Okay, It's a long poem, so therefore it's an epic. Um, it's one of the first epics in Middle English that's been preserved and that we actually have a copy of. So that's one of the reasons it's such an important piece. Um, now, tomorrow, I will be putting an exercise into the folder. Uh, be sure you follow through and finish this exercise. It shouldn't take you that long if you've already read the material. Okay, It's identifying some quick characteristics that um, 
that are easily gained from these passages. Okay? Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, stay safe. Again, if you have any questions, just let me know. And we'll talk later.